What's going on, YouTube family? My name is Andrew, and I'm the pastor here at Rose Church. Thank you for joining us. However you found our page, welcome to our family. Today, we are going to continue our series that we've been on for two weeks now called If My People. Today, we have a guest speaker. His name is Eric Butler from New Jersey over on the East Coast, and you are gonna love today's message. Once again, if you are not subscribed, hit the bell so you get everything that we are putting out. You get notified, follow with us, but you're gonna love today's message. Have fun. Well, this is a nice place, man. This, uh, uh, where, we, where, where I come from, they say it's a nice crib. But I'm happy for you because the last time I spoke for you, you guys were breaking down and setting up every day and a lot of work. But see, God, hard work pays off. Amen. God's blessed it because God's hand is on the work. Amen. It's good to be here today. It's a special day everywhere. And I would just like to say to those that are watching, maybe by YouTube, Facebook, all around the country, today is, is a good day, and God's going to do something special in your life. Amen? We've seen in a time of transformation the things that are changing. I've been preaching at our church a word uh, about transformation. That means to change. It means to have things go from one level, one state to another state. And, and what you're seeing right now all over this country and all over the world is a season of transformation right now. And I believe that because of that, God's going to raise up some people. Are you those people this morning? Hey, <laughs> this is a strong anointing here today. I usually sing, prophesy, preach, pray, and the whole bit, but I'll be good today. Amen. But it's exciting to be here with you. We do live in New Jersey, and it's cold over there. I left 76 degrees to come here to be with you. So y'all better act right. No. Amen. To give uh, 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 a respect to uh, our Pastor Andrew and his wife, Julia. Don't you love your pastors today? These guys are cool, man. A good man. I've known him for a long time, and his family, and a wonderful family. So you're in good hands here in this wonderful church. I want to jump right into the word because we're in a season that's very important. Very, very important. I'm more of a prophetic preacher, so hang with me. I may blitz through some things, some scriptures, but I want to get to a main point because I believe that you're called to do something great. And the essence of what I'm going to say to you is to encourage you today to take the, to, the torch and the mantle of God into the next generation. Can you say amen today? The Bible says in the book of uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32, it says that the children of Issachar, they understood what the times and the seasons were and what Israel ought to do, okay? What Israel ought to do. And it's so important to know what time and what season that we're actually in and what we're supposed to be doing because, like I said, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, we've been in the pandemic since uh, February, March. Uh, it's been crazy in all sections. I live in the East, and you know, you probably watch television. We, we got hit hard in my state really hard. I mean, every other day somebody was dying and all kinds of things that's going on all year. You know, should we go to church? Should we not go to church? When are we going back in, pastor? You know, what's going to happen? Are we sanitized? Are we uh, approved by the state? Or is the city regulations, this and that? And everything's like this. But the children of Issachar in the scriptures, it says they knew, they knew what Israel ought to do. So I'm talking to more of the ch church today. I'm talking to the believer today because we need to know what we're supposed to do in a time like this. In the days of Esther, in the days of old, when she was going in to speak with the king, the Bible says that Esther said, listen, if I perish, I perish. But I'm, I'm, I'm brought to this time frame in this moment. And so I want to begin with this. There's generations with a specific time, a specific calling, a specific purpose. Every generation has their timing. Everybody says, well, I wish I lived in this era or that era or another era. You know, every ge generation has a trial and a task. Every generation has a trial and a task. Would you have wanted to live in, in the times of the 1930s, 1940s when World War II was going on? Would you have wanted to live in the 1870s or the 1860s when the Civil War was going on? You see, every generation has their thing that God challenges them with and raises them to another level. And it's our time. Look at somebody and say, it's our time now. Oh, I'm excited. You see, in the 1700s, it was to set the people free from tyranny of the, of the royal crown in Britain. In the 1800s, it was to establish a nation and free a people that had been bound for over 200 years. 
In the early 1900s, it was to keep that nation free, build industry, build roads, and build an economy that would, that would be so powerful that it would touch the world. In the late 1900s, it stated that the assignment was to stop an Adolf Hitler and the German war machine for the global dominance and to build and create things that would change the world, planes, cars, cities, medicine, factories, production houses. All these things came forth during that time. They built houses for movie theaters, 1923, television, 1939, communication devices, roads, buildings, all kinds of things to build a colony of nations that would be in alliance against apathy. In the 1960s and 70s, it was to stop the Russian Revolution that was taking place, to stop nuclear war from happening. Every generation has an assignment. Are you all right so far? I don't want to scare you. <laughs> okay, it was always something like this. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the challenge was to reestablish a vision for a nation to rebuild its government and its leadership, to save a failing economy that was blowing up, in the 2000s, a generation of people were faced with war on our own soil from terrorists and wars in two nations that rose with people who did not know Joseph. They did not respect what we knew, nor did they care about who we were. So we went to war to defend our own land and liberty. And this is what was happening. And so all these things that keep happening, and you're in a time frame that is historic. You know what happened yesterday. An election took place, and one man was... Uh, crowned with the triumph, and another man is uh, in transition. <laughs> Don't want to talk politics today. But out of these things, what we're talking about today, every generation has its purpose, it has its moment. It has its call, and that, when that moment comes, we must be in it. And right now, there's a call, there is a moment that you and I have to grasp to. We have to grab onto what is the moment that God is captivating this nation and the nations of the world with? What is the call? What is God after in the nations of the world? Yes, it's the message of the kingdom of God. Yes, it's to win the loss. It's all these things combined. But are we prepared to embrace and to seize the moment? To seize the moment. And so every generation has to be fully awakened fully awakened to its purpose and to accept it and to do it and be willing to die for it. This is heavy stuff. You know, when I, I like Memorial Day, and uh, even as a kid, I used to watch the old soldiers. You know, you see those really old, old guys. When I was a kid, you know, they barely could walk, and they, they're marching like this. They got a little step left. You ever see those guys? They're real old. I mean, really old, like 70, 80, 90 years old, and they still have that heart. They still have that little step, the little, that little pop in their step. <laughs> you know, and I used to stand on the curb as a kid and say, wow, I wonder what war they fought. And they have a little hat on, and it will tell you what war that they were in, veterans of this war, veterans of that war. And the VFW would do this and that. And I would always watch them, and I would say, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have what I have today. It's true. I remember I had a friend, he was a friend, a man that was about 90 years old, and I used to talk to him, a friend of one of my buddies was his dad, and uh, I used to ask him about World War II all the time. He would tell me stories about being in Italy and all of what was going on, and he said, I never want to go back to that place. I said, why? He said, because your eyes could not stand to see what I saw. He said, and it never goes away. You see, because every generation is called to something that they have to be willing to die for. There is a cause that rises in a nation where people have to stand up and say, I'm count me in. I'm all in for it, and I'm going to do something about it. And I believe, I believe, I'm not talking like a politician today because I'm going to get into the word, but I believe that this is the time where God is calling us. It's one thing, I've been saved a little while, and it's one thing, we can sing a lot of songs and we can wave our hands and worship, but there is a call that God is dropping on this nation right now that's going to change everything and bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. Give God some praise today. Every generation has to awaken to this and accept it and be willing to die for it. Jesus said when it was his time, he said in John 12, 27, he says, so what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. When it was time for him to go to the cross, he turned to his disciples. He said, what do you want me to say? Father, deliver me out of this. He said, but for this cause was I born. 
For this purpose was I born. I came into the world to give my life as a ransom for many. I came into the world to save sinners. He said, what do you want me to do? Change the order of things? He couldn't do that. In Matthew 26, 40, Jesus asked the disciples to pray with him, and he asked them to pray with him for one hour, just one hour. He said, stand and pray with me for one hour. He said, while I go over here and pray. And every time he prayed, the Bible speaks very clearly that he said, Father, if it at all be possible, let this cup pass from me. He went away one time, and he said that. He came back. He prayed again the same prayer, let this cup pass from me. The third time he came back, and he found them sleeping. He said, that's all right. Sleep on. He said, that's all right. You'll have to deal with your generation and your moment, but this is mine. And he went back and said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You want to understand prayer? That's the essence of prayer. Not my will, but your will be done. Everybody say that with me. Not my will, but your will be done. This is the essence of it. And so he goes on. Of course, you know, he goes to that cross and he declares that. And of course, he goes and he allows himself to be crucified. In 1 John 3, 8, in the prophet's translation, I like to call it <laughs> passion. He says, but... This purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see, every generation has a purpose. And you and I have to find out our purpose, okay? First, First Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people called out to give God praise. That's who you are. You're special. Amen? There's no losers or failures once you find Jesus. You're chosen by God to be special in the earth. This generation, Jesus talks about the generation that he was in. In Matthew 23, 36, he said, I'll tell you the truth. He said, the judgment for all these things will fall upon this generation. In Luke 7, 31, just write the scriptures down. He, Jesus continues saying, how could I describe this generation of people? In Mark 8, 12, it says, what drives this generation to clamor for a sign? Listen to the truth, for there will absolutely be no sign given to this generation. In Luke 17, 25, he said, But before this takes place, the Son of Man must pass through great suffering, rejection from a generation. In Matthew eleven sixteen, he says, Don't you understand how I could describe the people of this generation like children playing games in a playground, yelling at their playmates? He talked about the generation that he was in and how unfocused it was. They didn't really realize the time and season that it was in. Can you imagine? Think about this. Can you imagine being in the generation where Jesus himself was walking amongst you? Like that dude could show up in here and sit in the back and say, who's preaching today? The living word himself, he was walking amongst us, and they didn't realize it. A lot of times God is, is still doing that. He's amongst us, but we don't really realize it. We don't really realize it, and so we can miss the moment of change and transition. You see, it's very important that even we that go before you leave a faith testimony behind. Every generation has a testimony of what it overcame. I named some of the things for you. 1700s, it was the... Revolutionary War, 1800s, it was a civil war. 1900s, early, World War I, World War II, all the different things that happened. That's their testimony. We built the planes, they could say. We built the roads. We built the, this, uh, the television. It came from us. These generations, everyone has a testimony. Souls and revivals that we talk about. The revival of this, the 1800s, the revival in the 1700s, the circuit riding preachers, all of this, all the testimony. So if I'm up ahead of you and I have to, I have to do something to help you, I've got to have a testimony that talks about the good things of God, that speaks of how great God is, and then take it and hand it back. So you have something to carry into your generation. It's called a double portion. Because if you have my testimony from my generation and you have yours, you've got a double barrel shotgun to blow the devil away with. This is real. This is real. And so what we're dealing with, you have to understand in Hebrews 11 too. Now let me go back. I want to I miss this one scripture. Because we have to understand that God has saved some things just for now. 
he's held up on some things for your sake. It says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, there has never been a generation that has been given the detailed understanding of this glorious and divine mystery until now. He's held many things back until now. People that desire to see what we're seeing today, they couldn't see it years ago. It wasn't their time to see it. It says he held this glorious and divine mystery until now. He kept it a secret until this generation. But God is revealing it only now to to his sacred apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. There's coming a move of God. In Hebrews 11.2, it says the testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Psalm 78 and 7 says, in this way, every generation will have a living faith in the laws of life and will never forget the faithful ways of God. I, you know, the, the beauty of being a believer is when God has saved you, when God has touched you, you can't forget that. That's your story that is branded on your heart, on your mind, and on your spirit. You won't forget the day when you met Jesus. There's only one time you're really going to meet him the way you met him, and it's never, never, never going to be erased from your mind. I can still go back and remember the day I was in a college dormitory room and Jesus showed up in the room. Did I see him? No, I felt him. I knew he was there and he changed my life in one night. One night. Changed everything. Blew me away. Same room I used to. See, only those that did what I did understood that one. The same room. Did all the bad stuff, and he walked right into the room and just manifested himself. Seriously. I didn't get saved in church. I didn't, I didn't, get, I didn't find Jesus in preaching, a choir, a worship song, nothing. I got saved in my college room where there were still roaches in the ashtrays. But anyway, let me go on with the message. That might go over too well, right? I'm not talking about bugs either. But anyway. That was still in the room. He said, that's all right. I'm after you. Because I've got something for you to do. And so what he'll do, he'll come into the situation of your mess and bypass everything that you're ashamed of. Because if you knew he was coming, you would hide everything. I would have put the ashtrays away. I would have put the coats up. I would have sprayed the room a little bit and fanned everything. Oh, Jesus, you can come in now. But he comes into the midst of your mess. Because he's called you to do something. Mm. Y'all used to preaching around here? See, the reason why I act like that, it's the same fire. See, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit the same night I received Jesus. Same night. Now imagine that. That's like a personal visit. He said, I'm going to visit this guy. I'm going to. Give him salvation. Then I'm going to baptize with my Holy Spirit and with fire. And go give him the evidence of speaking in other tongues. All in a college dormitory room in one night. So when he woke up that morning, he was one way. When he wakes up on Monday morning, he's totally different. That's called transformation. And so what what are we dealing with? This generation. In Acts 13, 36. It says this cannot be a reference for David, for after he passionately served God's desires for his generation. Psalm 102, 18, it says, write all this down for the coming generation. So recreated people will read it and praise the Lord. Amen. Now, other scriptures talk about the generation, and it talks about moving away from the bad sides of the bad things of a generation. Proverbs 30, 11 says there's a generation that rises and curses their fathers and curses their mothers. Proverbs 30, 12 says there's a generation rising that considers themselves to be pure in their own eyes, yet they are morally filthy, unwashed, and unclean. Verse 13 says there's a generation rising that is so filled with pride, they think that they're superior and look down on others. 14, there's a generation rising that uses their words like swords to cut and to slash those who are different. They would devour the poor, the needy, the afflicted from off the face of the earth if they could do it. But I'm looking today, as I look in this auditorium, in this sanctuary, this church, live stream, I believe I'm looking at a different generation. 
I believe I'm looking at a generation that knows what time and season it is. You see, I, I got to laugh at myself sometimes. I've been prophesying for many, many years, and I was, God spoke through me uh, back in October. And I gave a word in a church, and, uh, you know, it spoke about this election. And I was holding back. People would ask me, what do you think? What's God saying? You're a prophet. What's God saying? What's God saying? And they just sometimes get, off your, get on your nerves. You just want to go, bink. Leave me alone. Because I learned you can't say anything or do anything unless he says it. And so I gave this word, and the word was very simple. It talked about revival coming first. It talked about revival coming from the West Coast and moving to the East Coast. That's a good hip-hop song. Revival moving from the West Coast to the East Coast. To the West Coast and to the East Coast. Okay, let's go. I just had to get that out, you know. I'm old, but I still got some swag. You understand what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> but I prophesied. And the, end of, the word went from revival, and then the Lord said, and through this election, it will be known that the end will come, and it will be Pennsylvania that will determine the outcome. And I was in the state of Pennsylvania when I gave the word. And I'm sitting back the other day, and I was sitting on the airplane. I was flying out here, and, I, you know, the news was on. I was just chilling. <laughs> Had my headphones on, and I'm rocking all the way to Portland. I had my headphones on, and I'm chilling to Portland. And all of a sudden, across the screen, it flashes. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania has determined the winner. I said, that's it, Lord. Why am I saying that? Because the Bible says that the Lord will not do anything. It's that he first revealed it first to his prophets his servants. And so part of the generation that we're talking about, God's going to tell you what he's going to do. If you're a prophetic generation, which I believe you are, because you've been around prophecy all your life and a prophetic word hangs over your lives, you've been ministered to so much. And so God's going to start telling you things that are going to happen before they're going to happen. So you'll be able to launch a preemptive strike against the powers of darkness. The man is preaching about prayer because he's teaching you how to get ready for the battle in the heavenlies. It's the battles in the spirit. The battle's not of the flesh and it's not against humans. It's against the demonic powers to wrestle them to the ground. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And you and I have to understand that in this generation, you're so well taught. You're so well taught. What you understand now and you hear now, we never heard. But I'm telling you, you're going to do a great job. You're going to do a great job. I want you to look at somebody and say, we're going to do a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? I'm almost done. Why? Because I just believe that you're called to do something great. Number one, I believe you're called to achieve great things. I just believe it. And I'm excited for you. I'm excited for this generation. This, it's going to get better. It's going to get bigger. It's going to become more dynamic. You're, you're, you're going to be so anointed. You're going to change society. You're going to change history. You're going to change history. One writer says, successful and unsuccessful people do not vary greatly in their abilities, but they vary in their desire to, re to reach their potential. I believe that you're going to reach your potential. I believe you're going to take this piece and that piece and what we've given and what we've laid down and what other generations have laid down, and we're going to pick this up and pick that up, and we're going to actually make it and take it to the next level. Unless you try to do something beyond what you've already mastered, you will never grow. Did you hear what I said? You have to do something that's beyond what you've never done. You've got to do something that you haven't done before. Now, you may look at me today as a, standing here as a preacher. There were no preachers in my family. We didn't go to church as kids. Sunday for me was NFL. That's right, NFL, baby. 
Nice breakfast, NFL, outside, we were playing football. That was Sunday. Get the thick newspaper, get the comics, get the sports, whatever. That was Sunday. We were chilling. But no church. I didn't find church in Jesus, really Jesus. I didn't find church. They didn't come to Jesus in church until I was 22 years old. And so you're looking at a person that knew nothing about anything. He's just sovereignly picked for a generation. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be real with you. Can I get real? See, in, in the talk back church, they say, get real. Go ahead. No, okay. Anyway. While I was getting high, other people were going to church. And I would look at church people as being corny. Look at that little church boy. Same old black pants. Been to the cleaners like 400 times. There's so much that they shine in. His pants are shiny. Same old cruddy shoes. He ain't got no nothing. Same corny white shirt. Church people. They got on my nerves. And while they were going to church probably praying for me, I was doing my thing. But you see, God says, that's all right. Look at them. Because one day, you're going to become one of them. You may not have to wear the cruddy shoes and the black pants and the black suit every week, but you're going to become one of them. Because I'm going to change you, and I'm going to cause you to honor the kingdom of God, the spirit of God, the power of God, the anointing of God, and I'm going to use you for my glory. And you're going to be one that is raised up, that I'll raise up as a prophet to the nations that I'll send all over the world and will speak my truth to generations and generations to come. And even though you don't know what you're doing today, God says to tell you in this place today, you're going to do the same thing. There's a rising coming, folks. You got to understand, you got to do something that you never did before. I wasn't trained in prophecy. I, w I didn't go to prophecy school. I didn't go to prophetic training or prophetic this and that. No, a power came into my life sovereignly and said, speak for me. Talk for me. You say what I say and you go where I tell you to go. And I learned, yes, sir. King Jesus. Excuse me, this is when I feel the Holy Ghost, I go like this. <laughs> Got to get it out. Another lady said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. This thing is exciting what you're involved in. It's either a daring adventure or nothing. You see, God is looking for fruit in our lives. You, you and I are called to impact the world. You're called to impact the world. Even though the pandemic is going on, even though there's transition in government, even though the economy is bad, you and I still have the same call and same purpose. You're called to impact the world. The world. And you could do it. There's characteristics of people who achieve things. One, how did the children of Issachar continue to know what they were supposed to do. They kept a clear vision of what they were supposed to do. Two, they stayed focused. Three, they, gave, they, they had wisdom to work things out. Four, they did not associate with problem-oriented people, whiners and complainers. They stepped away from whiners or complainers. You can't be around people that are always complaining and whining and, and, and disappointed with this and disappointed with that and accomplish the will and purpose of God. You got to move them away from you a little bit. And they refuse to let opposition stop them. They defined their purpose. They stayed focused. They stayed in the, in the place of God. You know, throughout this entire pandemic, and it's been a long run, it seems like it's been about five years and ten months. I did a lot of funerals. The first two months, one of my elders died, COVID. Another brother died on the day before Easter. Saturday afternoon, 1 o'clock, beautiful Saturday afternoon before Easter, dropped dead in his living room, and his wife gave him, uh, tried to res resuscitate him with her little daughter, and he dropped dead right there in front of him, and she called me up screaming. And I'm thinking, this is a beautiful day like you two. Beautiful day. Okay, anyway, they didn't get that one either. Okay. 
But I thought it was a beautiful day, sunny day. And I had to deal with that. And I said, we can't say anything because it's Easter. I said, this will tear the heart out of the people. And other people kept dying. And it was bad. And I said, this is going crazy. This is crazy. But you know one thing the Lord told me? He said, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of chaos, don't lose your focus. Don't lose the mission. Don't lose the vision. Don't lose the call to be the people that demonstrate the kingdom of God. He said, you can't even get caught up in Republican-Democrat deal. Because that divided the church. He said, you've got to keep your eyes set, like Jesus did, set to Jerusalem like a flint. And he wouldn't be, deter he wouldn't be deterred from it. You've got to be those that continue, like it says in Hebrews, that they were looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith. As Jesus said, for the joy that was set before him, you've got to keep looking straight during this time. And know that you can accomplish the mission. And you're going to do it. I said, you're going to do it. I'm going to say it again. You're going to do it. In finality, I'll tie this in with uh, what I said today. In Hebrews 11:6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he to, that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In the Civil War, one of the great generals of the Civil War, and there was a special about him on uh, five or six months ago, was Ulysses S. Grant, which his name wasn't even Ulysses. It was another name. It wasn't Hugh Grant either, but anyway. He said this as one of the great generals. He said, hold your course until you win the war. He said, hold your course, he told his soldiers, until you win the war. You see, Jesus knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to Calvary the whole time. He said, for this purpose was I born. So he knew for 33 years that he was going to that cross. It wasn't just given at five, you know, you know you're going to the cross, right? And at 10, I'm riding my bike, God, you know, leave me alone. You're going to the cross, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, at 15, you know, Lord, I'm playing basketball, please. You're going to the cross, you know that, right? Yeah, I know. It wasn't that. He knew from the beginning. Before the foundation of the world, the scripture says the Lamb of God was slain. He knew what the end was going to be. He knew when he raised Lazarus from the dead that he was going to be raised from the dead. He knew when Peter denied ever knowing him. When Judas betrayed him, he knew. He knew. He knew when they slapped him in the face. He said, go ahead, make my day. He knew it. He knew when they plucked off his beard. He knew when they beat him. He knew it. And he probably heard that word. Hold your course till we win the war. He knew it when he went to Gethsemane. He knew it when he broke the bread up in the upper room and he said, take this is my body if it's given for you. So many times as you eat this and drink this, do it in remembrance of me. He knew then. I'm about to suffer the most crucial, wicked death that can be suffered. He knew it, but he went on anyway. And that's why the first prayer, we're talking about prayer, I'm bringing you back home now. He said, Father, he says, listen, fellas, all 12 of us, he said, the apostolic company, he said, we're going to do something great, but I've got to set the stage for it. He said, you guys stay here. Watch, I'm going to go over here. The old King James says, I'm going to go over yonder, wherever that is. I'm going to go over here and pray. And as he prayed, he said, Father, if it all if it all be possible, let this cup pass from me. Father doesn't say anything. Goes back, looks at the fellas. They might be over there, Shabbat, Baba. You know how it is when you get tired and you're praying, Shanamo, Cabo Tuto, Starbucks, Hoodie. He went back and prayed again. Same prayer, because he knew, couldn't get away from it. Third time, 
He said, forget about it. He said, let your will be done. Because I'm part of a generation that will do the will of God. And he went like this. Eventually, he died on that cross. He never broke his focus. And I'm admonishing you today. Never break your focus. You're going to see a lot of stuff on that television screen about the pandemic, 240,000. We're going to know some of the people that go home. You're going to see the economy shift. You're going to see the fluctuations in the political arena. You're going to see all types of things coming. But never break your focus. You serve God. And you stay focused on the kingdom of almighty God. <laughs> hey! Let me pray for you right now. Woo! Father, we thank you for a fresh anointing on the people of God today. You that are watching by live stream today, if you don't know Jesus, just say yes. Say yes to him. He'll change your life. He'll transform you. He'll move. Father, we pray today for your people all over this country and all over the world, for the body of Christ to come and snap back into alignment, to remember the initial call, the initial purpose of God, that Jesus, the captain of our salvation, has given to us that we should preach the gospel to every creature in every nation, that the gospel of the kingdom should be preached in the world as a witness, and then the end would come. And God, let us never lose our focus or break rank, but that we would be those you could trust and entrust with revelation and truth and your word today. Father, we thank you for it. Bless your people. Open our eyes to revelation. Open our minds to truth. Open our hearts to submission to you, that we would say yes to your will and yes to your way. That we would not only worship you with our song, but we would worship you with our lives. And that we would pray prayers that would be in connection with not our will, but your will being done. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. <laughs>